Gambling with an Edge with your hosts, Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin. Bob Dancer is America's premier video poker writer and teacher. He's written 10 books, including Video Poker for the Intelligent Beginner and the best-selling Million Dollar Video Poker. He helped develop the computer software Video Poker for Winners, and in 2004, he was inducted into the Video Poker Hall of Fame. Richard Munchkin has been a professional advantage player for over 30 years and is in the Blackjack Hall of Fame. His book, Gambling Wizards, Conversations with the World's Greatest Gamblers, is a testament to the many ways you can succeed at gambling. The goal of the show is that you'll be a more knowledgeable gambler tomorrow than you were yesterday. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good morning. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. We are pre-taping this show. As we, it is being pre-taped, Richard is at the moment off on vacation somewhere. He may or may not actually be on vacation when we bring it out of our secret vault. But uh, as, of today, as of when we're taping it, he is. My guest today is Jimmy Jazz. We, um, he and I reminisce about some video poker opportunities from years gone by. We reminisce about this back on August 11th, 2015. We received enough positive feedback from that show that we're um, going to reminisce some more. Uh, Jimmy Jazz, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Thanks, Bob. Good to be here. All right. Before we go on, Jimmy Jazz isn't your real name. Surprise, surprise. How did you happen to choose that name? Well, it's actually the name of a song from a band called The Clash, who was uh, came out of England, um, and they hit their peak in the late 70s, early 80s. So this song was actually on an album called London Calling. And I did a little research, and the song is either about um, a drug deal that went bad, about the decline of traditional jazz in England in that time period, or it's just nonsense lyrics. Um, nobody can quite decide, but it's a catchy little tune, and uh, it's a cool little little moniker. All right. So um, do you have pref- a preference, whether it's a drug, drug deal gone bad or just nonsense? I think I like the uh, decline of jazz story the best. So oh, I hope okay. that's true. All right. So um, I have a story I want to share about the Monte Carlo Casino here in Las Vegas. It opened maybe 1996, something like that. I was scouting it on opening day. I found they had about 20 $1 full pay deuces wild machines. Now, this wasn't, this was rare, but not totally unique. Uh, The Frontier had a couple of these machines, and so did the uh, Fiesta, which is now called Fiesta Rancho. But the latter casinos had a comp only slot club and the Monte, Car- Monte Carlo was offering 0.67% which was reasonably competitive at that time but that means for every $3,000 coin in the casino gave you back uh, $20 in cash back uh, since you could easily play $800 excuse me 800 hands on these uh, machines each hour it was worth maybe $50 an hour plus comps. Not bad for dollar player. And they had a lot of these machines, so a lot of players played them. After a week or two, the slot director took out all of the dollar full pay deuces wild machines, but he left in eight $5 full pay deuces wild machine. His logic was that professional players didn't have the bankrolls to play $5 machines, but well-heeled tourists would, and he'd make money off the tourists. His logic was naive. Uh, For some reason, these machines were also busy 24-7. I got one eight-hour shift on it uh, before they're taken out. Groups of players grabbed the $5 machines as soon as the casino opened, There was no reason to mess around with the $1 machine when there was $5 one available. And they worked out rotation so they could hold on to each machine 24-7. John would take it from noon to 6. Mary would have it from 6 to midnight. Pete would have it, etc. 
Uh, one of the groups needed a fill-in on one of the days when somebody had to skip a rotation. I was called and was glad to um, take it. Now, at that time in my career, I couldn't afford to play $5 machines on my own dime. So I found a backer who uh, thought I knew how to play, but um, he was going to sit right next to me during the entire eight hours, which was fine. Uh, eventually, the machines went away. That particular slot director was fired. He found some jobs uh, in later casinos, but eventually he was arrested for stealing from a casino he worked at. And so he left town. Came back a couple of years later trying to find jobs, and casinos didn't want any part of him. Once you get caught stealing, people treat it as evidence you will always um, steal, given the opportunity. Um, usually uh, the I'm sorry, I promise it'll never happen again, that kind of argument falls on deaf ears. Anyway, the big lesson for video poker players is to go to grand openings. There have been a number of serious mistakes found in casinos. Now, Richard will tell you about several table game kind of mistakes, and I can tell you about several video poker mistakes. Now, in Vegas, uh, SLS recently, last year was pretty sweet on the opening, but, but when the M opened, the Fiesta opened, the Win opened, there were a lot of mistakes. And most of the time, uh, you're not going to find anything, and you're going to have to deal with big crowds of looky-loos, and it'll be a big nuisance. But the occasional gems can make your year, especially when the new slot director was only an assistant slot director at his previous job. Another lesson is you got to keep your relationships with other players. Sometimes these relationships pay off. Um, you don't have to tell everything you know, but if I learn of something I can't use, I'm telling a friend. Maybe that friend will find out something in the future and pay it back. You don't keep close score on this kind of thing, but uh, if somebody always takes and never gives back, you kind of get them out of the loop. Usually people who you share good things with um, pay back. All right. Um, Jimmy, do you go to openings? Um, openings, as you mentioned, are kind of a, a mixed bag because the crowds tend to be huge, and it's a lot of uh, meandering around people to try and find that, that needle in the haystack. And I would say especially now that casinos are so prevalent, um, it, a grand opening may not be as big a deal as it was. I, I don't know. Um, and, you know, there's this darn day job that gets in the way of uh, dropping everything at a moment's notice and, and traveling several hundred miles to an opening. So I have, I have that disadvantage as well. Haley Marie is not understanding about these things? <laughs> Oh, she understands them perfectly. She just forbids me to do them. So. Ah, okay. That's, uh, I might have been married to her once. That sounds so familiar to me. <laughs> All right. The next thing I want to talk about, and I'm not sure if it was an opening or, or not, um, I was scouting for a Maristar and would be gone a couple weeks solid scouting for them. I'd start out in Council Bluffs, Iowa, which is right across the river from Omaha, and spend three or four days there, drive south to Kansas City, Missouri, spend three or four days there, across the state to St. Charles, which is uh, in greater St. Louis, and then down to Vicksburg, which is on the Mississippi River mid-state. Uh, each of those locations, Ameristar had some casinos in, had a casino in, and sometimes they wanted me to stop at Tunica on the way down to Vicksburg and check out some things for them there. So I'd scout, uh, tell them what the competition had, and write a report, and it was a nice gig. I um, was able to um, learn about video poker all over the country and, um, and get paid for it. Anyway, my first trips to Vicksburg, 
uh, was there was a Harris Casino downtown. This was in a bad part of town and wasn't doing particularly well. And so Harris decided to unload it. Finally, it sold and was renamed the Horizon uh, shortly before one of our visits. Uh, we, meaning me and my then wife, Shirley. And I got there about 4 p.m. on a Wednesday. We saw signs saying they were going to pay double royals every Wednesday, midnight to midnight. Now, a double royal promotion adds about 2%, assuming we're talking about 4,000 coin royals. And uh, we quickly shifted gears from being into a scouting for Ameristar and looking to see if we could find some good plays for ourselves. We looked around, but most of the games were still unplayable, even with the double royal, such as 964 double bonus that normally returns 96.4% at reset. So even if you add 2% of it, the game still sucks. Uh, but the machines were busy, so we figured, though, the casino was making money. And they were pretty crowded. We did see one empty 100-play machine against the wall in the back corner. We went to check it out. We weren't too optimistic. At many casinos, the uh, returns on multi-line machines are tighter than they are on single-line machines. Uh, on multi-line machines, such as triple play, five play, ten play, uh, they're actually produced by videopoker.com, one of our sponsors. At that time, they were calling themselves Action Gaming. They still do, but the video they also use the word videopoker.com. The casino pays an extra $15 to IGT, who pays a significant part of that back to videopoker.com, for uh, in addition to the buying the machine. So when they have this daily leash rate, Many casinos take it out on the players by tightening up the pay schedules. Now, we saw an empty 100... Um, we did have the 100 play machine, but the Horizon didn't know that they were supposed to tighten the pay schedules. On the 25-cent 100 play machine, uh, there was 9.6 jacks or better, 99.5%, and there was NSU deuces, 99.7%. Uh, now... Didn't have a lot of cash on me. I had about five, six hundred dollars, uh, and a hundred play twenty-five cent machine takes one hundred dollar, one hundred twenty-five dollars a play if you're going to play them all. Um, so basically, I had no money at all. However, back at the hotel room at the Ameristar where we were staying in the safe, there was twenty thousand dollars because we happened to hit a twenty thousand royal in Council Bluffs about two weeks before. So I got the job of playing a few lines at a time, basically to hold the machine, while Shirley went back to uh, Ameristar, 20 minutes away, picked up the money, and uh, also brought me some sandwiches because I was hungry <laughs> and uh, didn't want to give up the machine. So um, we did. She did. And then we played for uh, until midnight. Uh, this was a, uh, a lucrative opportunity. We didn't want to get, we didn't want to leave the machine. Was they were still going to have uh, the double royals going on? We ended up hitting. Uh, I think it was um, three royals in the uh, six hours. It's a little bit under royaled, but. Uh, it was pretty busy, and they were understaffed for the number of people there, and so it took a while to be paid. We did make sure that we tipped a little bit generously. A $10 tip on a uh, 2000 Royal was is too big percentage-wise, but it does get their attention, and so if you hit another one, they come quickly when they see your light on. So overall, it's a smart investment. Um. We ended up a couple thousand ahead, and uh, we did earn four hundred dollars worth of crap at the gift shop that we could uh, cash. Now Shirley is uh, gifted at undergoing the policy of uh, leave no crap behind, 
so somehow she got the four hundred dollars spent. Um, we also knew there was scheduled to be another double point or double royal promotion the following Wednesday. Well, we were going to be back in Las Vegas, and there was no way that we could uh, go back. So we told some friends, uh, somebody who had done me some favors, and so he and his wife went back. I recommended that they get on the machine by 6 p.m. Tuesday or earlier because in the week the word will get out and it might be tough to get a machine even though it starts at midnight. But even if they get on six hours early, the, the play wasn't that bad. Uh, it was 99.73. They had some promotion every day of the week and the slot club and and on a 100-play machine, you don't have to play all the lines. You can play one line or 37 or any number, and you still get the full value for the Royals. So it, they could basically be playing 25-cent uh, NSU uh, for the six hours, and then when the uh, promotion started, all of a sudden started playing $125 a hand if they wanted to. Now, they were both competent players, so they could learn the 8,000-coin 8, uh, strategy and one could sleep while the other one played and they would be able to hold the machine for 24 hours and most people wouldn't actually know that they were sh trading off necessarily because one would sleep and then they would come and sit together for two or three hours both playing and then the other one would leave and so it didn't look like they were actually switching but they were well, turned out uh, they got their six, and by 6.30, both machines were taken. Between 7 and midnight, several people came to ask them about um, when they were going to leave because they wanted to play the machine. My friend said they didn't know. Uh, one guy asked if he could buy the machine. So my friend said, sure, $5,000. That discussion went nowhere. So midnight, they started hammering away. Um, they weren't hitting royals, but on the other machine, the guy hit seven royals in the first eight hours. Uh, at 8 a.m., the boss came in, screamed at everybody, tore down the double royal signs off the top of the 100 play and told people, your next royal here only gets paid single. Uh, these particular machines were supposed supposed to have been excluded from the promotion but somehow somebody didn't get the memo uh, my friends found other machines to play but not nearly so lucrative they ended up losing six or seven thousand dollars and even though they were playing a game that was too good to lose oh well that happens fortunately they didn't take it out on me they still appreciated the tip and were disappointed they couldn't cash in on it this may well have been a casino opening uh, promotion. That was our last trip to Vicksburg for Ameristar, I think, and we never received an invitation to the Horizon that made traveling there worthwhile. All right. Uh, you didn't hear about that one, did you, Jimmy? Tell it. No. That would have been a good one. The um, You played in Vegas at the New York, New York. Yes. Uh what interesting story do you have for that? Okay, this was back maybe uh, 2003, around that time. So uh, New York, New York had um, 0.67 cash back, which was, I, I won't say the going rate, but not, not unusual. Uh -huh. um, and they had a, a bunch of 9.6 uh, jacks or better machines that were quarter to dollar denomination. Unfortunately for the players, um, the dollar denomination paid cash back at one fourth the rate it should. So, if you played an hour's worth of quarter jacks or better, or an hour's worth of dollar jacks or better, you got the same cash back. Now, New York, New York knew about this. It had been mentioned to them many, 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 many times, and they either chose not to correct it, which I strongly suspect, or didn't know how to correct it, which I highly doubt. Either way, they were uh, under cash backing their dollar players by uh, 
three-fourths of what they should. So my wife and I were there, and um, they used to have a quarter uh, triple play progressive with eight six jacks are better and ugly ducks that sometimes went positive so my wife was waiting to play that and she sat down at a single line ugly duck machine to kill some time while waiting for a progressive seat to open up and she will do that from time to time play some less than 100 percent games just to kill some time for our non-video poker listeners ugly duck is a little under 99 percent right uh, right so she's playing and watching the countdown. At the time, the New York, New York machines had a countdown meter that counted down your points and free play. So she called me over and said, this one doesn't look right. And I said, okay. So we counted down the hands and did the cashback conversion. And for some reason, this machine was paying six times the cashback it was supposed to. Sweet. So my 98.8% machine was paying 4% cashback. Oh. Now, that's an unusual number. I would expect it to be four times or 16 times, but this was six times, so I'm not sure how they did that, but they did. Well, they just took 8% and took two off. What's the big deal? That could, that could have been. Who knows? So what you have now is a uh, close to $30 an hour single line play for quarters, and you know, you're not going to get rich at that, but... It was positive, and the comps made it a good play. You know, you had all the sweets you wanted, the meals, the limo rides, show tickets, whatever you wanted. For a quarter player, getting yeah. those kind of comps is highly unusual. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, they also had a promotion where if you went to go see their Lord of the Dance show, on the ticket stub was a voucher for double points. And I never tried to use that on this machine um, I think even New York, New York may have noticed 8% cash back on a quarter machine. So we never did that. But even just taking that promotion, that's you know 1.5% cash back, and you've got dollar jacks or better if they actually paid the cash back, is a pretty good play, even for New York, New York in 2003. So, Well, they still had pick and poker then. But that was they did. A, that, that, but that was a maybe a larger denomination machine that you than you wanted. Right. They also had a uh, either fifth, I think a fifty play dollar jacks or better machine as well in the high high limit area. So we could have, uh, I mean, you could have bombed away on that too. And I'm surprised people didn't grab a show ticket and do that. If you got a one percent play on dollar fifty play jacks or better, that's a pretty good play. And I do know players who would see the show every night <laughs> or at least buy a ticket they were uh they had played enough they could get comped tickets but right. they didn't they didn't want they thought that would look pretty suspicious but they physically bought a show ticket for thirty dollars forty dollars whatever it was turned in the coupon every day and if they were ever asked they said i really love that show this, this the dancing is so intricate it is so wonderful <laughs> I asked him, how well do you really like the show? And he goes, I have no clue. I've never seen it. But anyway, um, that was that. Now, yep. extra countdown points. That's actually happened within the past couple months at the Downtown Grand, which I didn't hear about it till after it was over. Um, my Million Dollar Video Poker autobiography talks about countdown problems at the MGM Grand back at the turn of the century. Well, year 2000. And I uh, converted that into about um, $75,000 extra payoff plus four automobiles. Nice. So these things happen, and you need to be alert for them. And, uh, and they still happen today. It's like the downtown Grand incident was three months ago. And they happen both ways with overpayers and underpayers. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. I want to tell a story that happened at the Golden Nugget in downtown Las Vegas, uh, maybe 18 years ago. So, um, so the details of it aren't going to come back, but the conversations that it arose will. I went through a... Um, I could not explain this to my friends at the time. Now, 
they had this promotion at the uh, Golden Nugget, possibly a tournament. I don't remember exactly. But Shirley and I were each playing there. And, well, actually, Shirley played a little bit, and I played on both cards. But um, but I played, uh, you know, considerably more than she did. But the promotion allowed us each to have RFB, and uh, we had some friends visiting from out of town. Her relatives from Ohio, as I recall. Her, uh, so we got each got a room, and her friends stayed in... Uh, in the other room. Now, we we scheduled a dinner one night at Stefano's, which was a sort of upscale Italian eatery. They had singing waiters. And so when it was time to go eat, uh, the ladies went up to the restaurant to get the table while the guy came down to High Limit Slots to fetch me. At the time, I wasn't quite finished the the way the slot club worked at the golden nugget at that time was it took seventy five dollars coin in to earn one point which was worth fifty cents if you pulled your card any time mid countdown you lost any any partial points so I was playing a five dollar machine which meant it's twenty five dollars a hand so it took three hands to make one 50 cent point. And so when this guy came and said it's time to go eat, I had played one hand into the next point. So I told him, okay, I'm going to play two more hands to get to the next point and then I'll join you. As it turned out on that particular time, I got two blanks, two zeros. Two hands in a row scoring nothing is not particularly unusual at Jacks are better happens all the time not your favorite time but it happens no big deal this guy though absolutely could not understand how this was a smart play what he saw was me losing fifty dollars in order to earn one point that was worth fifty cents to him it was an idiotic play my explanation that before the hands were played my expected loss on the $50 uh, of play was $0.23, cents and vol- voluntarily undertaking a $0.23 cent loss for a $0.50 cent gain was um, was a good deal, and I was going to be doing this thousands of times, so uh, it's going to end up profitable in the long run. The fact that I missed this time wasn't particularly important to me any more than if I'd hit... Uh, four of a kinds for $625 a piece on those machines, that would have meant I was an extra smart player. It's just, those are just random results and it's the long term that's important. So as far as my friend was concerned, I was clearly delusional. He kept repeating, you can't take EV to the bank. But since he was getting a nice dinner for free and a nice weekend for free for that matter, he shook his head and tried to keep his mouth shut about it. He finally had to tell his wife over dinner. Um, This lady looked with great sympathy over at Shirley for being married to a guy who was so cockamamie in his thinking. As far as they were concerned, regularly losing $50 to earn 50 cents was the way to the poorhouse. As far as I was concerned, I was playing with an edge and in general liked the results. Jimmy, Shirley, you must have had some variation of the same conversation through the years. How did you handle it? Well, I can see where you had a tough sell to try and convince him that what you're doing is the right thing to do. But you probably had an easier time convincing him of what you were doing than your friends in Vicksburg had telling their friends that they lost $7,000 on this great play and they had to send a thank you to Bob Dancer for it. I think they had the harder task there. But, uh, you know, I I get in this discussion a lot. Um, You know, people will ask me about gambling, and, you know, I'll talk about what I call my hobby. And um, I'll explain what I do and how I do it and why I do it. And it usually comes down to three different conclusions from them. Um, One, I'm a degenerate gambler and a complete total liar. Two, I somehow cheat to get what I get. 
or three that I'm crazy to risk so much for so little gain. Can't more than one of those be true? Yeah, they could be. But usually it, it breaks into one of the three. So in, in your case, if you play a thousand hands on that promotion, and you're going to win about, I don't know, 475 or so and lose about 525, does your buddy think that 525 of those plays were bad and 475 were good? I mean, you, you, you can't break it up like that. That's That's the mistake in his thinking is that you can isolate one individual play from the play as a whole. So all he sees is, wow, Bob, you had $50 30 seconds ago that you don't have now, and you earned a whopping 50 cents. So, I mean, I understand where the thinking comes from. and It takes you a while to, uh, after you do this to uh, wrap your heads, head around what's going on and, and figure out that the long-term results what you have to strive for. I had an a email exchange with a guy on VP Free. Uh, it's a video poker Yahoo group. And typically the people on VP Free know a little bit more than the general public about gambling. So Some know would, a lot more. Yeah, you, you would expect a, a certain higher level of knowledge. So I had described a play I had. I, I don't even remember what the play was, but I was up several hundred dollars for the day and ended up losing money for the day. So this guy in VP Free tells me I'm an idiot because I didn't lock up my profit for the day and then resume tomorrow. So I went back and I said, how is winning $300 today and losing 500 tomorrow different than losing 200 today, assuming you put the same amount of money through? And he says, no, you, you, you got a chance to lock up a profit for the day, and you would have been ahead for the day. Like, that was your ultimate goal. So, you know, I wish it were as easy as how you structure a session or what you call a session, determining or increasing your EV on a, on a given play. That'd be great. We'd all be jillionaires, but that's not quite the way it works. You know, when I started playing video poker many, many years ago, 25 years ago or so, and this is back in the days of coins and inserting coins. I used to buy a roll of quarters for ten dollars, and I would play till that either doubled or I lost it. And then, if it doubled or more, I would cash out and then go to the change booth and change my money and get bills back, and then buy a roll of quarters and repeat the process. And very quickly, I realized all I'm doing is getting my hands dirty and making a lot of work for the change lady. If I'm, you know, if there's a play's worth doing, it's worth doing. And no matter how you call your session or whatever you want to call it, if the play's good, you should play it. If it's not, you shouldn't. And that should really be the, uh, the determining factor in whether you, you play the game or not. Um, I do must hit buys every once in a while. And those are machines where there's a, a jackpot. There's usually a couple, usually a minor jackpot and a major jackpot, and they have to hit by a certain value. These it's are usually, slot machines, not video poker machines. Correct, correct. So the, the bottom value might start at $25, and it has to hit by $50. Uh-huh. So at some point they go positive, and it depends on the meter feed and a few other things. Now, I've been in a situation many a time where I've sat down at what was a positive play and played for a while and been down $100 or $150 chasing a $46 jackpot. And to anybody walking by, it's like, what are you doing? Even if you hit, you still lose money for the whole play. Yep. And while that's true, um, if I quit just because I'm down money, the play becomes a whole lot worse. Um, overall, actually, the worst, you know, as you lose money going through it, the actual play gets better because you have a higher percentage for the coins you're putting in in the future. When you get very close to that $50 mark, even if you're down money, you know, you're probably 115, 120% play. And if you're going to walk away from that, you shouldn't put the first coin in. So it's, it's very tough to explain to people. Um, and the other thing that is probably hardest concept for people to understand is, you know, I'll tell them, okay, I went to Las Vegas, I played at this casino, I ran $30,000 through in two days, and they gave me the room and this and meals and cash back and blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. And their response is, wow, I can't do that. I don't have $30,000 to lose. 
And it's like, well, you know, I don't either. Um, just because you're betting $30,000 doesn't mean you're going to lose $30,000 or anywhere near that portion. Right. So you're betting a dollar and a quarter at a time or $5 or whatever your stake is. Right. So they don't get the whole concept of how that thing works. So it's one of those discussions where I won't offer information and I will discuss it with people until the point where I see that there's no way they're going, I'm going to be able to make them understand how this works and it, it doesn't do any good anymore. If people are interested, I'll be happy to talk to them until the cows come home. But in general, people um, don't believe what I do and certainly what you do is, is even possible. That's true. I, uh, I participate on the uh, videopoker.com forum and there are there's at least one guy there who uh, claims with regularity that since I'm not willing to publish my tax returns, that proves <laughs> that I am not a winning gambler because uh, he just doesn't believe it's possible. And he repeats that about three times a day. And uh, that's just welcome to my world. All right. Um, I had a uh, kind of similar story. Back in maybe 2000, 1998, something like that, I had I was a regular columnist for Casino Player and Strictly Slots at the time, so I was kind of well-known. And I got a call from this guy I'd never heard before, and he was from uh, maybe Chicago at the time. And he said he and his wife were coming to town, and he was thinking about being a a writer for um, Strictly Slots, and he wanted to chat with me so I could evaluate whether or not he would be qualified to do this. So I said, sure. I got him a comp lunch somewhere. I don't remember. And so he and his wife were there, and it turns out she has a really big problem with his gambling. As far as she was concerned, anyone who spends more than you know, two hours every six months gambling has a gambling addiction problem. And my friend was a intelligent game player, uh, positive results. But the fact that he was temporarily ahead was not convincing at all to his wife. As far as she was concerned, he was a, a, a gambling addict and she wasn't happy about that. So I was asked for marriage advice, <laughs> which was um, not a position I wanted to be in. Uh, I had a head of relationship a couple decades before where with a similar situation where the lady could not understand what I did. and uh, was, But um, I told him, that I was positive there's a difference between uh, gambling successfully and having an addiction, uh, although there are people who do both. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of them was going to have to make a um, some sort of accommodation for the other. Either he was going to have to quit gambling or she was going to have to learn to trust him or they're going to have to split. That was Those seemed to be the three options. I didn't see any other choice. And I was not going to make a recommendation as to which one was the best for them. They ended up splitting. Uh, he now refers to her as his learner wife. And uh, so he, I uh, have met a subsequent wife and uh, seems like a pleasant lady. But um, you have to uh, figure out how to get along. It's not easy. Well, if you think about it, though, and you go talk to somebody about how gambling works and they don't gamble, it's it's a tough sell. And if you do a quick Google search on how to win at slots, you're going to see 11,000 different links for absolute noise garbage systems that are going to guarantee you're a winner. So you're just the 11,000th and first person who says, yeah, I have a way to win. And most people are going to say, wow, what are the chances that he's telling the truth as opposed to the other 11,000, and it's going to be hard to convince anybody. I, I understand that. I mean, I, I get why people don't believe this actually works. And, you know, Gene Scott used to say that something to the effect of, or somebody said that 
the more math you know, the less interesting gambling becomes. And Gene disagree with that. And I kind of agree with that. I mean, once you really understand the numbers and how it works, the actual game itself becomes, I think, less interesting because you kind of know what's going to happen. It just might take longer. If that's really what you believe, you've never played Ultimate X. You, ha- you have no idea what's going to happen next. All right. Well, I'll play one hand of Ultimate X at a time. That's about it. That's when somebody's left a multiplier on it. Sure. All right. Marketplace. What is the marketplace? Uh, this was a, This is a uh, little party store, and it's uh, directly south of the Hard Rock. Um. I had gotten this play from a friend of mine, and um, you go in there, and it's it's a party store, and not the most upscale place. So, I mean, if you're used to uh, playing at the Bellagio, you'll be disappointed. But they had a bank of, uh, I think, eight machines that were tied to a progressive, and the base game was 7-5 bonus poker, which isn't uncommon in the gas stations, party stores, convenience stores. And there was a progressive on the straight flush. That's like flush. a 94% game or something like that. Yeah. There was okay. there was a progressive on the straight flush to royal flush and I think the aces. But for whatever reason, the uh, two pair paid 10 coins instead of the five. Now that adds 11%. Yes. So you're at 105 or whatever it is plus the progressives. And there were only three machines in the bank. The other eight didn't have uh, didn't have this game on them. And I think the Royal reset it at fifteen hundred, if I remember. But so it was a it was a decent play. I mean, these machines weren't quick. Maybe eight hundred hands an hour. Um, That's quick. Quick enough. Yeah, maybe maybe a little slower. But I mean, you're not going to get anything comped, and you're not going to get any benefits. And if you do hit, every cash out was a hand pay, and the guy had to go into his till, and you know, it took a little while. Well, they're colorful people who frequent that store. Yeah, that's true. It is true. Um, what was interesting, though, is I managed to play this about three or four times before they finally pulled it. And every time I played it, there was a uh, gentleman, probably in his 50s, in a starched white dress shirt um, and a tie, playing away, and he was there every single time I played. I later came to learn from a local pro that this gentleman literally was paying his rent on this play. So he was in there a lot, a lot, banging away whatever it were out to be, 30 or $40 an hour, and that's how he paid his rent, and somehow figured that even a party store is going to notice eventually that the same guy is playing the same bank of machines and, and doing fairly well. So eventually that one disappeared as well. Yeah, I didn't hear about that machine. And uh, some of these machines, the people who hear about them, stay very quiet about them for some strange reason. This was actually from uh, Elliot Shapiro. Elliot was a good guy. He's Elliot no, was a very good guy. He's no longer with us, but... Uh, He's a very competent player. Mm-hmm. You had a friend with, uh, you ha- You call him three or four different names. <laughs> yep. What was that all about? There's a, there's a local player, um, and I could never remember his name, so we just started calling him Ken Frank Dave. And I think his actual name is Ken, but we, I could just never remember his name for whatever reason. Now, this guy's interesting because he knows video poker strategy up and down, forward, backwards, you know, not so ugly ducks, two cards, straight flushes, every little penalty card situation under the sun. And if you two were to take a quiz heads up, you, you know, you might come out a little bit better, but it wouldn't be by much. I mean, this guy knows his stuff very, very, very well. But what's interesting about this guy, who knows the game so well and plays a ton he would occasionally, or sometimes more than occasionally, play without a slot club card. Because if you play with a card, then the casino knows when you win, and then they'll they'll change the game so you don't win as much. And he would also tell you don't That's play... That's not too- all bad strategy, by the way, but well, okay. Yeah, it, it gets better. And don't play too fast, because then the casino knows you're a good player, and then you won't win as much. That's... They could kick you out if you play too fast. One way, casinos know that you're a pro 
is if you play at lightning speed, especially on two machines at once. So, okay. so he's not wrong there. Okay. Well, he he was he would only play one machine. Okay. And then also he had some superstition about dice. If you bet with a pregnant woman or with a black woman, they they make money at dice. So then you just bet with them, and then you'll make money. Well, that sounds like a good plan. Yeah, and like I said, I don't know what would happen if you bet on a pregnant black woman. I think you you hit the jackpot or something. I I don't I don't want to go there. Okay, go ahead. Right. So, but I mean, this guy, I mean, it's just quirky that he knows the game so well and then still believes some of this stuff, which I guess you're giving him a little bit of credit for. But then, you know, recently, I would say in the last couple of years, he was playing and talking to a buddy of mine, and he was complaining that he was down forty thousand dollars for the year, which is a substantial chunk. He's basically a quarter player, you know, multi line, but basically a quarter player. Uh huh. So my buddy says, uh, "Wow, you know that's that's really a bad year. Uh, how much money did you run through?" He goes, hey, "You know, I ran about four million dollars through." Ah, wow. so he's losing one percent. Yeah. So my friend says, "What are you playing?" He says, "Well, I'm playing the ten play quarter seven five super aces." Uh, that's about a one and a quarter percent house yeah. edge. Yep, a little bit ninety nine ninety eight point eight five, I think. Okay. But this guy is like surprised. He's down forty grand. Running four million through on a minus one percent game, which is forty thousand dollars. I mean, if anything, he ran a little bit better than he should have. So it, it's funny how somebody can be so incredibly knowledgeable on one side of the gamble and so completely irrational on the other side of the gamble. I, I just found that interesting. A lot of gamblers have leaks like that um if you're reading about poker players who are mm-hmm. exceptionally good at poker a lot of them play bet sports and mm-hmm. or bet craps or bet blah 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 and regularly lose even though they're smart enough to win money at poker being good enough and smart enough to win money at poker is much harder than playing video poker correctly. Right. And uh, and they can do that, but then they'll go and blow it all on something else. So a considerable number of gamblers of various stripes have leaks in their games. Well, that's a little bit the Stu Unger deal. He would yes. blow money like a drunken sailor only because he was so good at poker that he knew he would get the money back and could do it again. This guy can't possibly get his money back on what he's playing. That That's the difference. All right. Uh, Westward Ho. Ah, uh, the, the Westward Ho. Kind of used to be next to Stardust, sort of. Yes. Westward Ho was an interesting place. Um, I don't know what the, what the proper term for it is. Um, functional, I guess. I mean, it was a little casino. It was run kind of like a family business, and it was one of the last couple casinos that were independently owned. Um, but they uh, they did some funny things. Um, I was back there in like 2005 or 2006 for CES, uh, Consumer Electronics Show in January. Um, and I had my rooms all set except for one night I had to pay $19 at the Westward Ho. That, so that, I was, but that probably ticked you off to have to pay for a room. It did. I'll bet. It did. So I said, you know what, and you know this wasn't the smartest play, but I said I'm going to play some blackjack and I'm going to get my room covered. So I play two hours or so, and I'm betting 15 to $20, um, which I thought was more than enough. And I asked the pit boss for a room comp, and he goes to his screen and comes back and says, you know, I, I can't comp you a room. Okay. Um, I said, out of curiosity, what do you need for a room comp? And he tells me $50 a, a hand for four hours. Ooh. And I'm thinking... I'm at the Westward Ho. I yeah. mean, the book rate is 19 bucks a night, and you want me to pay play four hours of $50 blackjack in 2005? I mean, that's, uh, that's a Flamingo room cap, not a Westward Ho room cap. Uh-huh. But I was polite, and uh, I said, thank you. Okay, and then I finished playing, and I said, well, can I get a, uh, a restaurant cap? And he says, sure, no problem. So he writes me a restaurant cop, and I go, and I have, you know, shrimp cocktail for an appetizer and a big steak and a beer or two and ring up a $40 tab. So he had no A $40 problem. tab might be hard to, were you by yourself? Yeah, well, it, it, took, it took some work. Oh, I'll bet. Westward Ho, that's, uh, that's, that was considerable effort. 
Yeah, I think I took some desserts home for uh, some friends and stuff. Uh -huh. But what's curious, though, is, you know, I can't comp you a $20 room, but I can comp you a $40 meal. And to me, it doesn't make, make sense. Uh, maybe they figure that the rooms is a different budget or whatever, but I guess the lesson um, I get out of that is even if you don't get your original request, you might be able to work something out that is as good or maybe even better. So always ask politely. Well, I agree with that, although he may not have realized that um, you were going to take a $40 food comp, even though it was <laughs> unlimited with yep. um, certain cases. He may have... Um, thought that was a uh, $15 comp he was giving you. All right, we got about two minutes left or so. You told me a, a Gold Coast story that I thought was kind of amusing. <laughs> All right. Um, this is back a bunch of years ago, and we're going to the Gold Coast, and I, don't, I wasn't playing there that much. So we decided to go have their buffet, which was, was pretty good. And I think you get two bucks off if you show your slot club card. And I had a, a freebie coupon or a buy one, get one. I forget which. But for whatever reason, the cashier wouldn't do both, even though there was nothing on the, either the promotion in the slot club or on the coupon that says you couldn't. So it kind of honked me off. Um, I think she took the buy one, get one, but wouldn't give me my $2. It, it, it kind of bothered me. So as uh, I do, I collect the coupons and I had a stack of them and I decided when I left I was just going to start passing them out to the people in line so I think I gave away about 10 or 12 of them to the various people so they all got a free $12 dinner um, and uh, thanked me for that and the reason I did that was because they screwed me out of my whole $2 I'm not exactly proud of that one but I uh, it's actually um I have eaten at the Gold Coast Buffet, and I'm not sure you were giving people a um, a big favor by letting them eat there, but uh, and kind of recommending it. But it's um, I would not pay retail for that meal. But a lot yeah. of a lot of casinos don't let you stack up promotions, and some don't say it specifically, but that's their policy where mm -hmm. you. Uh, you cannot use this in conjunction with something. Sometimes a, a food comp of a $20 food comp, you cannot use it on the daily special of whatever that is. So different casinos have different rates. The fact that the Gold Coast did this would, would not be surprising at all to me. Uh, your reaction to it is amusing to me. You, uh, as I mentioned last time you were on, you have a, a stronger reaction to uh, bumps in the road than uh, some people do. Only, only when it ticks me off. And something about her attitude and the way she treated me really ticked me off. Generally, I'm, I'm pretty easygoing, but every once in a while I get, uh, I get riled up. All right. So uh, since the, the, the receptionist or cashier ticked you off, take it out on the Boyd Corporation. That makes Absolutely. a lot of sense. <laughs> All right. Very good. We're talking to Jimmy Jazz. This has been fun. And uh, when you hear this again, this is a tape show, so we thank our sponsors for allowing us not to have commercials today because our sponsors are South Point, The Palms, and VideoPoker.com. And we want you, uh, next time you listen to us, very likely Richard Munchkin will be back. We thank you, Jimmy Jazz. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. Thanks. You've been listening to Gambling with an Edge with your hosts, Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin. Subscribe to the show in iTunes, and episodes will be delivered to you automatically every week. Archived versions of past shows may be found at BobDancer.com and richardmunchkin.com. We welcome emails at gamblingwithanedge at gmail.com. Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin are both available on Facebook and welcome your questions. The sponsors for the show are the South Point Hotel, Casino, and Spa, the M Resort, the Palms Casino Resort, and the website videopoker.com. Join us again next week for another Gambling with an edge.
Views and opinions expressed on this program were those of the hosts and guests and did not necessarily reflect those of Vegas All Net Radio, its affiliates, or its parent company.